We are good. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allahumma salli salatan kamila. Wa sallim salaman tamman ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Alladhi tanhalu bihi al-uqad. Wa tanfariju bihi al-kurab. Wa tukhda bihi al-hawaij. Wa tunalu bihi al-raghaib. Wa husnu al-khawatim. Wa yustasqa al-ghamamu bi wajihi al-kareem. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Tasleema kathira. First of all. I have to remind myself and others to thank Allah Ta'ala for the ni'mah of Islam and that you can go searching around for happiness of your heart. Everywhere you go, you're not going to find it better than in the recitation of the Qur'an daily in large amounts. Daily and in large amounts. Because Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says, وَذْكُرُ ذِكْرًا كَثِيرًا Make remembrance of Allah much. And Sayyidina Musa says, Kainu sabbihaka kathira wa nathkuraka kathira. So we make tasbih of you much and a remembrance of you much. Wherever dhikr is mentioned in the Quran, it's always associated with the word much because a small amount doesn't benefit as much, hardly benefit. There's some benefit, of course, we can't say it doesn't benefit. But the munafiqeen, what did they say? Allah says about them, La yathkurun Allah illa qalila. So the hypocrites, they remember Allah, but very little. And so it didn't benefit them. It didn't cure them of their hypocrisy. So people who can't can, can't have the discipline to do a lot of dhikr, if they have any emotional trouble, they go to drugs. They drown themselves out in music. They womanize. They do all sorts of these uh, vices that, that are at your fingertips in society. Okay, They're at your fingertips these days. So you have to fight. And we're here together to, 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 to help each other out. Right, fighting against our nafs, going against our base desires, and filling our hearts with the heavenly word. That is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's going to be what fills your heart with sa'ada and happiness. And you're going to feel like, I have so much, I have everything that Allah has given me, I can't uh, uh, count these ni'mah. And that's a sign that you have shuhud and ni'mah. One, sc one scholar asked the question, uh, how do we know that if we're, we're grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So someone said, when you look and you realize, I can't count this ni'mah, said that's gratitude to Allah. That's when you realized your situation with Allah. Today we're going to talk about Sayyidina Idris alayhi salam because yesterday in a podcast that's going to be released, it was a wild podcast. You got to listen to it. We went about an hour and a half. Uh, all the old crew, Alex, except for Sad, we missed Sad, but Alex was there, Naz was there, Murad we had, we had other people on. It was a wild podcast, but we talked a little bit about the Isra and Mi'raj. And we noted there's another prophet who was very unique. He actually died in his Mi'raj. He died not because he couldn't handle his Mi'raj, but he was, his death was appointed at the time of his Mi'raj. Okay? And what was hap what this, who this prophet is, is the prophet Idris, alayhi salam. So who is he? And how is he so unique? Because Allah says, Wadkur. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, mention in the book, Wadkur fil kitabi Idris in no kana siddiqa nabiya. Okay. Warafanahu makan and aliya. Sayyidina Ibris uh, Idris alayhi salam. Allah mentions in the Quran, praises him in the Quran. And he says about him that Sayyidina Idris was a Siddiq in no kana siddiqa nabiya. And he says about him, wa Ismaila wa Idrisa with al kifli. He mentions them that he's a righteous, he was a prophet, and Allah raised him. We refer, elevate him to a high place. So, what about this Idris? And how do we know about him? The stories we know about him come from Wahb ibn Munabbih. Wahb ibn Munabbih was a Yemeni from a Jewish background, and he came and he, he, he used to tell the stories of the prophets and the Tabi'een and the Sahaba. I think that he, he did meet Sahaba. They would approve some of the stories. So, they said that Idris, he is the fourth generation down from the Prophet Adam alayhi salam. So Prophet Adam alayhi salam came. One of the Prophet Adam's younger sons was named Sheath, also known as Seth in the English language. Sheath took over the Khilafah after Sayyidina Adam. When Sayyidina Adam became a bit older, Sheath took over. Sheath witnessed his brother Qabil kill Habil. Cain killed Abel. He witnessed that. He watched and he saw how his father, Adam, exiled Qabil from the mountain. In the old days, in the ancient times, Adam and his progeny all lived on a mountain. 
And the difference when we say Jabal and Tur, there's a difference between the word Jabal and the word Tur. The Jabal is a, is, is a dry mountain. It's like the type of mountain that you see in a picture that's like a perfect stone. But uh, uh, a Tur is a mountain that has life in it. Like, how does it have life in it? It's got caves that you could seek protection in. It's got rivers coming down it. When you have rivers and you have greenery, what do you attract? You attract so livestock, uh, animals, I mean, and, and you can eat those animals. You can drink the water and you can eat the greenery from the trees. So, and a tur is more of like a gradually going up mountain so that you could live on it. There's some flatlands on the mountain. That's how they all lived. And Qabil was exiled from the mountain. And Sheath witnessed that. Sheath took over. From the younger generation, two generations after him, not directly descendant from Sheath, was Idris. Okay. Sayyidina Idris. So now the human population is vast, right? And they lived hundreds of years and they had plenty of kids. And so the human population was vast. And Idris is a follower of Sheath. And Idris was an Abi. His description was that he was very big, but he was extremely soft spoken. Okay. And he was a contemplator. He used to contemplate constantly, like the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet Messenger was described, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to go uh, to the mountaintops. They couldn't find him. And only as a boy, six, seven years old, they'd find him sitting on a hill. And he said, what did he do? Looking, looking at the mountains, looking at the stars. So contemplation. Because as we've said a million times, to know that there's a creator does not require a prophet. It just requires you to look and you can see that things are designed perfectly. Do you ever see there was a news story? I don't know if the doctors here, they're probably aware of it. There was like a medical thing that was, you know, caught a lot of people's attention. They put it on the news. A guy got sick really badly and he coughed up part of his lung. When they took part of his lung out, the doctor said it was gorgeous, right? He just kept looking at it. He cleaned it off, the blood and everything. And then he picked it up. There's a picture of it on, online. It literally looks like a tree. Right? It looks exactly like you drew a tree. So subhanAllah, the same shape of the, the thing that gives us air and the thing that receives air, they have the same shape. Like inside the lung, when you look at how the lungs go out, it's like an upside down tree. So one gives the air, it's shaped like a tree. The one receives the air, shaped like a tree. Right? I mean, it's amazing. You gotta, this, there's one manufacturer here. Right? There's one maker. So that's what Sayyidina... Uh, uh, Idris used to do and then he started preaching and then he was informed you're a prophet too okay and he had a lot of followers he gained a lot of followership and his area some people say it was what's now known as Babylon and then he moved to Egypt Allahu Adam about all these stories but he he preached well and one of the things that he is unique for is he's the first person who came up who was inspired by Allah to write with a tool he was the first person to write words down with a tool, okay? So he was he was inspired with that. He was also inspired by Allah to divide up the day into 12 units, All right? Divide up the day. So the idea that we have 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night, that was one of the inspirations given to Prophet Idris. He was also inspired with a third innovation in humanity, which is to stitch your clothes. Before that, they would get large skins, okay? and then wear the skins around themselves and maybe tie it up. But he was the one, first one who came, who was taught at this time to stitch up the clothes, okay? And that was something that's unique, again, to him. You know, some of these things don't come from the Prophet Sallallahu but okay, it's a story. Uh, it's passed on by Wahab ibn Munabbih, it's found in the books, and there's no, no harm in believing it, all right? So when the Prophet Idris came, the, he, he was, when, in his day, Sheath was the Khalifa, Seth, and he was waging war on Qabil. At the time, there's no Kafirs. There was either a Salih or a Fasiq, okay? There was no such thing as a Kafir. No one did, there was no Shirk, there was no Kufr. Everyone knew Allah exists and angels in heaven and hell. But there, the, the two groups were the Salihin and the Kafirin, uh, a Fasiqin. So those who followed Adam and his ways, and Prophet Idris met Sayyidina Adam. He, he met Sayyidina Adam in his old age. The Qabil went away with the people and, became, and, and they were uh, those who sinned. They did everything that was haram and they didn't study with Adam anymore. They didn't follow sheath. They didn't worship. Okay, so they were the Fasiqeen. They were outside the mountain. 
Eventually, the groups got so big that the followers of Qabil would come to the mountain and they would poach people because the people of the mountain, the believers, the Salihin, they had safety. Okay, they had food, they had numbers, okay, and they had happiness. The followers of Qabil wanted to come in and spend time with the followers of Adam, alayhi salam, and Sheath. And then they started corrupting them. So Sheath and Idris together waged the first jihad to keep them away. So the first jihad on the earth was waged by Sheath and Idris. Sheath and his junior follower, Idris, in the Bible is called Enoch. Okay. So they waged the first jihad and they, oh, they had a banner. Jibreel told them, when you wage war, you make a flag. That was the first flag that was made for humanity. And they put up a flag and Sayyidina Jibreel was teaching them everything. At that time, religion was not just something that was, you're just given the revelation. No, you're given the revelation and you're taught how to live. So many people wonder, how did Adam farm and everything? Sayyidina Jibreel taught him all these things and brought tools for them. So he taught him, you have to come in rows and this is how you fight. He taught him how to do these things. And so they waged that jihad and pushed the followers of Qabil far away. That the followers of Qabil would not come anymore to, um, to corrupt the, the Salihin. And this is the thing. Inclusivity has its limits. You're inclusive of somebody who is on the same agenda, but is not that good at it. That's our inclusive. In any group, in any group, you're inclusive of somebody who's weak at fulfilling the group's goal but believes in the group's goal. In any group, Democratic Party, vegetarian, vegan clubs, Republican Party, any group, this is Zionist clubs, Jewish clubs, groups, whatever. If you join the group and you're promoting the opposite of the group, the opposite goals of the group, what do you think is gonna happen to you? You're gonna get kicked out. Nobody says, oh, you're not tolerant and inclusive. This makes no sense. If I come and I join your golf team, but I say, no, no, I like to hit it all over the place and get a high score, right? And they're like, no, the goal of golf is to get a low score. So you're off the team. If I join a football team and say, oh, I like to run it back and, and fumble it. That's what my, my identity. You're going to be off the team, right? So likewise, what's, how, how are we Muslims any different? We have a goal. If you come and you're expressing the exact opposite goals and purposes, we need to be away from you. That's how simple it is. Okay, uh, so we have something precious, which is our hearts, and we don't, we are people, we have to remember, we don't, we, we don't trust Iblis, he's always there. We don't trust our nafs that could succumb to Iblis. So we have to be surrounded with people who are righteous. And you might think to yourself, oh, well, uh, it's sort of selfish. It's not selfish, it's safe. Do you trust people to enter your home all the time, or you have lock up your home all the time? Do you trust people to breathe on you, or do you wear a mask these days? So what's it, what's the, different with your heart? So they needed to keep these people away from them, okay? And by the way, when you clean your heart and you clean up your deen, you become someone that people can benefit from. People will come to you on your terms and benefit from you and leave. You don't just open the door to any old person to come in and influence your life and be part of your life. And then you're the one who gets corrupted at the end. This makes no sense. So they had to push them far away. And that might explain to us why some of the, you know, the anthropologists have come to the conclusion that humans at some point were really backwards. Allah Adam, it could be as a theory that it's the followers of Qabil. They were pushed far from the civilization of the people of Adam and Sheath and Idris. And so they had to start from scratch and they didn't have any of the benefits of the revelation. So now their kids were born, okay, uh, uh, shorthanded they were they were born without the uh, that that revelation and those teachings so that's one possible explanation but eventually what happened was the followers of idris and sheath they became so many that they couldn't keep up even education their education and they would leave the mountain on their own you can't police people they would leave the mountain they would go and they would mingle with the people of Qabil, and things began to get to get uh, uh, corrupted. When Idris worked, this is at the end, when Idris was working, he was very successful in the dawah. 
He asks Allah, oh Allah, keep me on the earth for a long time because I'm doing well here and I want to live a long life. And the Prophet said, who is the best person? He lives a long life in righteousness. He lives a long life doing good deeds. That is the best of all people. And if your, short, your good deeds are short, then Allah takes you, it's better. And if your sins are a lot and you're going to keep sinning, then if Allah takes you, it's better as well. So the, but the Sayyidina say, Idris, he asked for this. Then every prophet, no prophet is taken away for death except by permission. So the angel of death came to Idris and he said, it's your time to go. He said, no, I don't want to go. I want to live a long life and do righteous work. Okay. Nothing more satisfying to the heart than this. He said, oh, well, then you're going to need to ask yeah, one of the chief angels for this. Okay. So it may be that the opposite was. Jibreel came and told him, are you ready to die now? And he said, no. He said, then you go speak to Malik al Mot yourself. He said, how am I going to meet Malik al Mot?" He said, come onto my back. And then they went up to the fourth heaven. In the fourth heaven, he said, here, we're going to meet Israel. And you could tell him that you want to live longer. He said, okay. He went, he gets to Israel, he sees Israel. And Israel said, subhanallah, I just read in the loh that I have to take your soul in the fourth heaven. I said, how? Right? And you came right up to me. He said, I came to you so that I could live longer. He said, and then what happens when I live when you live longer? He said, whatever date that you appoint for yourself, then you're going to be taken out that date. He said that if that's the case, just take me now. When he saw the heavens, see that's the thing. Allah showed him the greater reward. So we believe in good and greater. We don't believe that the reward of Allah is just good and bad. You may be in a good state and you can ask for better. That's why the, the dua is Jazakallahu Khairan. Right, not al khair because al khair is assuming you're in the bad. So there's always more. Allah ta with Allah Taala, there's always more. That's why we don't have, we shouldn't have depression. We should never be bored. There's always more with Allah, but go to the right source. You'll get more. If you think you have an A plus life, you could still get bored with that. That's the truth, right? If anyone has an A plus life, and you live that life for ten years, guaranteed there's going to come a time where you're a little bit bored of it. You're like, yes, I'm 100% thankful. I'm happy. I'm not excited anymore, though, right? I'm totally happy. If this is all Allah gave me, I'm 110% happy. I'm not excited, though. But you have to believe that Allah Ta'ala has A+, plus, and there's A++, plus plus, and A+, plus, triple plus, right? And then gold, platinum, right? There's no end. There is no end to the karam of Allah that he could always get better and better and better, right? So a person should never... The problem is with ingratitude that's the problem a little bit of like i want some more excitement i want a little bit that's not a problem the problem is ingratitude and there are many people they start something then they get bored with it they leave it off that's terrible we like consistency and gratitude and know that allah always has more right there's always something that can give you something else so sayyidina idris he said i want to live longer on this earth and i want to do so much more well guess what the meeting with Israel couldn't have been on the earth. It could have been on the earth. But Allah ordained that it happens on the heavens. When it happened in the fourth heaven and Idris looked around, he said, no, no, I'll, I'll die. <laughs> because when you see the heavens, and that wasn't even paradise, that was just the heavens, the realms above us. When you see that world, you wouldn't want to come back. That's why they say, what is the greatest miracle of the Mi'raj? This is one of the most amazing things. I think Hujwiri said it, or one of the early, he said, the greatest miracle of the Miraj is not that the Prophet went, it's that he came back. If you went, you would be like, holding on, I'm never coming back. And he came back and his mood was good. He didn't come back and say, oh my gosh, I hate this. You, you can't go and live a certain life. And then let's say you're living in a mansion and you have a, a cook and you have a masseuse. And then you get shifted downwards to live in a studio apartment. You got to cook your own food and you have a small, tiny little budget to live by right? It's going to be impossible. You're going to be in such a bad mood. But the Prophet wasallam, his goal was never himself. If Allah wants to take me a Miraj, if Allah wants to put me in Mecca to struggle, ahlan wa sahlan. What, it's what Allah wants is what's good. That's how the Prophet has aligned himself to what Allah wants. And that's why Sayyidah Aisha says, why do it, O Messenger? Why? How is it 
that I see that Allah is always answering you before you even ask. Right? But the reason is the Prophet had made Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his only goal. And as a result, before he asked for something, Allah grants it to him. How about the Qibla? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we know that you're thinking about, we know that you desire Mecca to be your, your Qibla. So we make it Mecca. Because because his heart was desired in that. So Prophet Idris alayhi salam, the mercy of Allah to him was that he didn't want to die because he wanted to live a long life and do righteous and do good and spread the da'wah. When Allah showed him the heavens, then he accepted to die. And his soul was taken in the heavens. That's the meaning of وَرَفَعْنَاهُ مَكَانًا عَلِيَّ Prophet Nuh was the junior to Idris. It is said that Prophet Nuh witnessed Idris. And Prophet Nuh, of course, all of them were of the same essential lineage. There was only one tribe at that time, one skin and one language. And Prophet Nuh took the baton after him. Right? So there was prophets at all times, but the number of human beings kept spreading and growing and growing and growing to the point that it became very difficult uh, to keep everyone educated, to keep everyone guided. Very similar to our world today. There's more people worshiping Allah to, today in this year, uh, in this period of time, than let's say 100 years ago, than 200 years ago. But there's also way more people in disobedience of Allah. So the proportion is decreasing. The number is increasing. The number of, of people worshiping Allah is always increasing, but their proportion may be decreasing. So we feel like we're much less. We feel like things are much worse. That's true, right? Because of the proportion. وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ Allah says we've elevated your, your remembrance means that there will always be an increase okay, of, of the dhikr of the Prophet ﷺ and worship in Islam and the spread of knowledge. It's always increasing, except that proportionately it's decreasing, the percentage and the weight as a result of it. الله خير فوق سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتوب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتوب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتوب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وصلى الله بارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما اللهم صل صلاة كاملة وسلم سلاما تاما على سيدنا محمد الذي تنحل بالعقد وتنفرج بالكرب تقضى به الحوائج تنال به الرغائب وحسن الخواتم ويستسقى الغمام بوجه الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سنيما لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك نسأل الله العفو والعافية والسلامة والرحمة لنا ولجميع أمة الإسلام ومن أعاننا على هذا البث المباشر وصلى الله بارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين